The Alpine Inn Fall Rock Fest is coming October 8th with no cover charge and a free shuttle to Bennett O'Reilly's, plus yard games and an outdoor bar. Enjoy a full day of music with Jen Wilder, Overplayed, and the Greedy Volunteers. Check out the Alpine Inn on Facebook for more information. Get outside in Pepin County. Pack up the family and visit the childhood home of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Sail on Lake Pepin, bike the Chippewa River State Trail, hike up Maiden Rock, and throw a line in a trout stream. Sign up to win a vacation at visitpepincounty.com. Winona has got a story to tell you. October 14th and 15th is the first ever Sandbar Storytelling Festival. Hear compelling stories about the human experience and cultural traditions by award-winning and nationally known storytellers. Learn more and get your tickets online at sandbarstorytellingfestival.org. We sat down with storyteller Alton Chung. We discussed how stories can help us safely re-experience our own hurts and wounds. What can people expect from his shows? Early influences and a special story that had a hand in the start of his career. Check out Alton during the Sandbar Storytelling Festival taking place October 14th through 15th. You can find more conversations, food reviews, live music, and events on our website, lacrosselocal.com. I'm Amy. And I'm Brent. And this is Lacrosse Local. Well, I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, and what led me to storytelling? <laughs> I took a class. <laughs> there was a class being taught at a local bookstore. I was living in a small town in Oregon at the time, and I knew the, the bookstore owner, and he, I saw this advertisement in his, his newsletter. I was sitting in his store reading his newsletter, and he said, what's this storytelling class? And he said, well, there's an interesting story behind that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've got this post that had all this information on it. I put it in my newsletter, and then I get a phone call from this lady saying, I guess I'm teaching a class. He says, what do you mean? He said, well, I gave you that post a year ago. So this post had wandered around his desk for about a year. And then he, I said, this is too weird. I, I got to take this class because I was bored. <laughs> I had nothing else. To, I, you know, I was really bored, but I was working in town, and, but, you know, I had really nothing else going on. So I took the class. It, it, she did theater games for the first, you know, meeting. Then she said, go home, prepare a story, come back and tell it. And I had done a little bit of speech and debate in high school, and I'd just been to South Africa, and I'd visited some professors of mine who were on sabbatical. So I had this book of South African folk tales. I just kind of just picked one, and I came out and told this story. And the lady, lady kind of looks at me and says, okay, what are you going to do with this talent? I looked at her and said, what? Nothing. I don't care. You know, <laughs> I got a job. Well, she was the head of the local storytelling guild, and she kept after me and after me. So I said, okay, 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 fine. I'll tell stories for you guys. So, you know, I, I told stories for them for about a year and a half, and then I kind of put it aside. Then I moved up to the Portland area. And I got, you know, busy, busy doing other things. And I, I joined the local storytelling guild in Portland. And they said, oh, we've, there's this thing called a showcase. It happens every couple of years down in Salem. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you got five minutes on stage and you tell your story. And, you know, the whole audience is made up of librarians. I said, oh, OK, fine. Because everyone kept telling me, you're a storyteller, you're a storyteller. I'm like, what does that mean? So I had one five-minute story. I went on stage. I told my story. I said, great. You know, it's a great experience. I had been in front of an audience in a while. And I started getting phone calls. Come to my library, tell stories for an hour. We'll pay you. I said, pay money? Really? <laughs> and so that was kind of my, you know, my entry into this whole thing. The thing that really got me kind of really hooked was the, uh, the power of story. I just started out, maybe it was just like first or second festival as we've been at. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I had this kind of, you know, half story. And as it's ticking in the back of my mind. And I kept having this, this, this feeling, got to tell that story, got to tell that story. And I knew it wasn't really ready, but I, I told it anyway. It was a story about my dad growing up, you know, poor in the plantation camps in Hawaii and how other kids would make fun of his lunch. And he didn't know whether to go and throw his lunch away because it was just like, you know, codfish in, in this hot sauce and rice. But that's all he had. But he was hungry and he didn't know what, you know, all the kids were making fun of his stinky fish rice, you know, and he didn't know what to do. And he grew up. You know, with that whole idea, he said, you know, my kids will never have to be embarrassed about this. And, you know, no one's ever going to make fun of my, my lunch again. It was kind of a half story. And I kind of told it. And even, you know, even afterwards, you know, the, the lead teller kind of pulled me aside to, you know, that story wasn't really quite done, you know. And I said, yeah, I guess. <laughs> but afterwards, after the show, this lady came up to me with her son and she said, my son has autism. And, you know, he was we got a free ticket to come tonight. And. All the other tellers, he was not paying attention. But as soon as you started telling that story, for whatever reason, he started paying attention. And I've never seen him do that before. And then the next day, the festival was closing down. And this woman comes up to me. She hands me two cans. He said, this is salmon. 
that my sons, we caught in the ocean, we smoked it, and I want to give it to you for you to give to your dad. See, I raised four of my sons by myself, and we know what it is to be hungry. Hmm. Give this to your dad. And that's just going to, you know, rock my world. I said, oh, my goodness. You know, here's this half story. And, I, and for whatever reason, I had to tell it. And it may not have been the best story to tell, but for these two people, it was important. And that's when I realized, okay, you know, stories have power. And it may not be important to a lot of people, but for someone out there, this, whatever story you're telling is important to them. You know, you kind of reference this on your website. You know, you say stories allow people to safely re-experience your own hurts and wounds. So, I mean, that kind of what you just went through there. Is that something that you're always looking at when you're kind of creating these or performing them? Well, it's something that's always in the back of my mind. I'm attracted to telling difficult stories, you know, hard stories to hear that are important. But I also know that I can't take people to where they need to be, to, to really in, take them on a journey in the story, unless I have walked that path before. I have to do my own, you know, if something is impinging upon me that's bothering me, I have to work through my own stuff so that once I'm able to come up and bring all the emotions of the story up front and show it to people and hold it so they can have their own experience and immediately switch and go to another character. So I have done my personal process work that whatever was bugging me, that's when the story is ready. If I break down on stage, no, the story is not ready. Hmm. I haven't done my own work because as soon as I break down on stage, people immediately get out of the story. They go into caretaking mode and say, is this guy going to be okay? What can I do to help? <laughs> my job as a storyteller is to keep them in the story as long as I possibly can so they can have their own experience. Everyone experiences the story differently because of their own life experience. I say yellow flower. And then everyone has an own image of a yellow flower. It could be a rose. It could be a, you know, uh, something, you know, another type of flower. I, you know, but the whole, a yellow hibiscus. But the whole idea is that it depends upon your own life experience of what you imagine. And my job is to keep you in that space of imagination so you can go on the journey and experience the story. I'm going all the way through the journey and coming out the other side. I'm the tour guide. That's my job. Digging into your life here and your website, you know, it looks like you do a, a variety of different sort of programs. I mean... When I can ask, what can people expect from your show? But it looks like you do everything from <laughs> Jap Japanese American experience to ghost stories to how do those all work together? Or do, do you do them separately? Or is it just kind of a, a wave throughout? I guess I'm, I'm one of those people who get bored easily. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I, I tell Asian folktales, Hawaiian legends, ghost stories, the Japanese American experience of World War II, Chinese immigration stories, stories from the plantation days in Hawaii. Whatever my curiosity takes me, I do the research and I create these stories. The stories I bring to the audiences really depends upon who the audience is, the expectations of the client, whoever's hiring me. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to find that balance, that match between what is it that the audience is expecting? What do they want? And is the story appropriate? So I have a wide variety of stories and I try and match the stories that I have with that audience. You know, if it's an audience of young children, okay, we're talking Asian folk tales, maybe Hawaiian legend. If it's older adults, okay, maybe stories on aging or what it was like, you know, historic stories and things like that. Also depends on how much time I have <laughs> because these stories range anywhere from like five minutes to half an hour. And it really depends. So every performance is a custom job. I look at it and say, okay, who's the audience? What do they need? What are they looking for? And even though, you know, you're, you've, you've been me telling stories, you know, in the middle of the, of the whole session, and all of a sudden you realize, uh-oh, you get that tingle in the back of your neck saying, this story is the one that needs to be told today. You change everything, you tell that story. I pay attention to those things because it's this dance between you and the audience and the stories happen in between. And what is it that's calling right now? What is needed right now? That is the things that I also, also you know, really pay attention to. Kind of looking into the whole story, the storytelling sort of medium, you know, it seems to cross different genres of comedy to theater to all sorts of different kind of playing back and forth. Is there any sort of like influences you had as younger, even now that kind of inspire in the way you perform from music to artists, to painters, to anything? Well, um, I grew up in Hawaii and in Hawaii, there's a thing we call a talk story. People, some people call it gossiping, but we call it talk story, <laughs> where, you know, growing up, people, you know, the elders and everyone, we just going to sit around and circle and people tell stories about, you know, what their life and what experience, things like that. And so that's when I picked up a little bit of, you know, 
the, you know, the culture and the areas and the stories of the local area. I'd say that uh, growing up, you know, my mother was Japanese and so she, there's a lot of Japanese influence. She bought me lots of Japanese folktale books and things like that. And as a kid, I looked at them and I knew the stories, but it wasn't until I was adult many years later that I went back to those books and I started really looking at them and then seeing the different layers of the stories. I'd say as far as influences go, you know, I was an apprentice to Ethnotech. Ethnotech is uh, Robert Kikuchi Nengoho and Nancy Wong. They are based, uh, you know, international storytelling people. They've been in the business for over 30 years. They brought me on as an apprentice when I was first starting out. And I learned from them how much effort it takes to perform at their level of excellence. And, you know, the importance of gestures and choreography and their style of telling stories. So a lot of that kind of influenced me. I think a lot of the oral history stuff that I do when I interview elders, when I interview veterans, I was privileged enough to go and accompany Tim Tingle. He's a Native American Choctaw teller. I was driving him around and he was interviewing Native American elders. And I got to see a master at work really diving into stories and collecting the stories. The storytelling community is very broad, very warm, very inviting. And all these people who I've, I've encountered, they've all been very gracious and very helpful and answered all my questions. When I first started out, Margaret Reed McDonald, she is like the folklorist in the folklore in the storytelling world. I drove around for three days at a festival and she, <laughs> I pelted her with questions for three days and she was <laughs> very, very patient and she answered all my questions, you know, because I was so hungry. It was so, so needing to find out more information about this storytelling thing. So we're great friends now, but <laughs> that was, you know, my entry into the storytelling world. So, I mean, you touched on, you know, kind of a real heartfelt story in the early instance about the food and the smells and things like that. Was there any particular story that that seemed to be kind of like, that was like, this is, this is something different, I guess, you know, this is something that kind of, you know, resonated with the most people that kind of started on your path and really made it an opportunity for you to do this for a living in some sense. Probably the story that influenced me the most that set me on the path that I have been walking was the, uh, story that I call Heroes. It's the story of the 100th Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the all Japanese American unit that fought uh, in France and Italy in World War II. For whatever reason, I got a wild hair and I said, oh, you know, these are the people I heard growing up. You know, I didn't know much about it. I didn't know much about the internment camps. I, I knew that it happened, but, you know, I grew up in Hawaii and I didn't really know much about that area other than the fact that everyone in the community really respected these elderly men who were, you know, part of this military thing. So I said, okay, okay, I'm going to tell this story. So I called up an uncle. He's a close friend of the family. And I said, hey, hey um, I know you're a sergeant in E Company in the 442nd. I want to interview you. I want to tell you a story. And he said, no, 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 no. It's been 60 years. I'm still trying to forget. Huh. Okay, okay. I backed off. So I spent you know, a couple of years gathering material and I spent weeks writing this thing. And, you know, I, it was but the longest piece I'd ever written at the time. It was like, you know, 25, 30 minutes. And my first time I'm performing it, a friend of mine said, Oh, I, I got a gig for you. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll do it at this, at this club. It was the hundredth battalion club, all these veterans, their families, these people actually live through this experience. The first time I'm telling the story in public was to them. Wow. And, um, you know, that was, you know, when I realized, okay, these are the people I'm telling their story back to them. This is important. Later on, I was invited to the 65th reunion of the 442nd 100th Battalion. And, you know, Hilton Hawaiian Coral Ballroom, Ballroom, 1,200 people in the audience, including Senator Danny Noy, people from the Pentagon, and I'm telling their story back to them. That's, you know, what I wanted to do. I wanted to honor these men before they started going away. And mm -hmm. to me, that whole idea, you know, of being able to tell that story, that was, for me, earth shattering. Before I was gone on stage, the, my uncle, the guy who's close from the family, he comes up to me and says, oh, yeah, Hill 140? I was there. And I kind of looked at him, Hill 140. That's happened in Italy. That's where, you know, Ted Tenoy got the Medal of Honor. And he said, yeah, I was on that hill. You see this leg? This is all shorter than the other. I was hitting the ankle and I got evac'd out. So I missed all that lost battalion stuff. You know, when they saved, you know, the, the Texas battalion in the Volge Mountains in, in northeastern France. But I was there. And he walked away, you know, to go talk to his friends. His wife, my aunt, comes up to me and says, I've been married to that man for 55 years. This is the first I've ever heard of any of this stuff. Wow. And to me, that was kind of like, wow, okay, you know, I did my homework. I was able to do this thing. And now that they realize that, yeah, I was serious, I have the credentials and they can tell, tell me their stories now. 
So yeah, that that whole idea of being doing historic research and telling stories about people, I realized how much work it took to create historic stories and to do it well and to do it, you know, telling their story truthfully. That set me on this whole path of doing historic stories and really honoring these people and their experiences. That's wild. For something like coming up here in Winona, the inaugural Sandbar <laughs> Storytelling Festival taking place in October. What are you doing for that festival? What's, what's going to happen? What can people expect when they come see you? Oh, my goodness. This is, a, uh, it's so thrilling to be part of the first people, you know, doing this festival. I am absolutely thrilled. And the people you've got coming, Reverend Jones, Bill Lepp, you know, these people are just top-notch tellers, and I'm honored to be in their presence. Daniel Morden, I think, was, you know, he's a teller from Wales. He was the one who was the real driving force, you know, helping the people to put together this festival. For whatever reason, he wasn't able to make it this year. He'd be, I think he'll be coming next year. But, oh, you know, just to, to walk in amongst these august people. These are, these are really, really amazing tellers. Each of them different in their style and what they tell. Uh, what people can expect from me? Well, I haven't really found out, you know, how long I have for the different <laughs> sets and things like that. But uh, you can rest assured that, yeah, there'll be, there'll be a, probably a ghost story. There'll probably be some folk tales and Hawaiian legends. You know, if I have the time, uh, yeah, you might hear some World War II stories or some stories about immigration. It really kind of depends, again, uh, who's the audience, how long I have, and, you know, the setting. I think there is going to be a ghost story night, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Uh, I don't think I really haven't even seen the schedule yet, but um, <laughs> very excited to be able to go in and even to bring, you know, all that I, uh, the years of experience I have and the stories I've collected to this brand new festival to go and really sort of show people, you know, what storytelling can be. You know, Bill Lepp is just an amazing, you know, comedic storyteller. And he also tells deep historic stories too. Reverend Jones, oh, amazing guitar player. Tells a story, you know, this, this music and the blues and things like that. Uh, that's, I'm just in awe, you know, these incredibly talented people and it's gonna be a real treat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's something just to see all these, you know, nationally known storytellers come to the small river town of Winona, Minnesota. For those people who want to, want to maybe dig into you a little bit more, kind of check out your work, maybe watch a video or something, what's the best avenue for them to either follow along or kind of dig in? Well, uh, I have a website. It's uh, Alton Chung, A-L-T-O-N-C-H-U-N-G.com. Let's see what other things. If people really want to know more about storytelling, I'm also the editor-in-chief of a new brand new uh, e-publication which we call the story beast hmm. which it's free and people can find it at storybeast one word dot org slash archive you know the people just pop out there the july issues out there we're about ready to release the august issue it's a monthly epub you know an e-magazine on storytelling articles and storytelling stories photo essays, artwork, all kinds of things like that. And this is a, something that we, my team, decided that they wanted to go and put together to go and introduce people to storytelling and be a resource for storytellers. Lacrosse Local Podcast is a production of River Travel Media. Do you have an interview idea you'd like to share with us? Message us on Facebook at Lacrosse Local. Find out more about us at lacrosselocal.com. And you can subscribe to the Lacrosse Local Podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you like us, rate us five stars. We appreciate it.